Okay, so do we have any outstanding questions, things that people want to know that you know, they didn't have a chance to ask you? Yes, sir. The, that, those equations you gave us for K1 and K2? Yes. Is that applicable for the, both, both the cases of damp and damp? Yes. Um, <coughs> sort of. I was trying to get it to work with the undamped and I couldn't get it. With, with underdamped and it didn't work. Um, <clears throat> there's sort of an easier way to do it with underdamped. Um, so the question is about the constants that go along with it. Um, I would do it like this. Um, for your underdamped case, your step response is always equal to 1 plus, um, well, there's a cosine term and a sine term. Okay, So there's a cosine of um, omega naught root uh, 1 minus zeta squared t. And then there's a sine term uh, at the same frequency, omega naught root 1 minus zeta squared t. And what you can do is you say, OK, each one of those has a, has a constant. And then you can apply literally the exact same initial conditions. So you can say that y of t equals 0 equals 0 and y prime of t equals 0 equals 0, and solve for a and b. And when you do that, uh, the cosine term comes out to be like minus 1, and the, the other coefficient comes out to be something like zeta over 1 minus zeta squared, I think. You, you can double check that on your own time. I, I did it yesterday, and I think that's what it came out to. Without going into too much detail, if you do what you were doing before and use those same coefficients of k and apply those, whatever, those same formulas for k, you can actually work it and eventually arrive at the same answer. So there, I mean, it's not like, it's the same problem. It has the same solution. You can, you, you can do that method and get this. It's just sort of easier to start from this. I, I think this is roughly correct. Um, I did want to answer uh, one quick question um, before I moved on. Um, is it always, is the formula always, um, is it always going to be uh, V out double prime plus, uh, what was it, R over L, V out prime plus 1 over L C, V out equals 0. Is that always our, our characteristic equation? You asked me. It turns out, it depends on the circuit. <laughs> OK. This equation only makes sense for that circuit. OK, and we only looked at one circuit because we only looked at one circuit. So what if, like in the book, there is an example where they have a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor in parallel, and they want you to come up for, with an equation for V. Okay, assuming that there's some initial voltage on the capacitor, they want to know what's the final value. So they say, come up with a differential equation for that. So um, let's just try that real quick and see if we get the same answer that we got over here. So um, what's the current going through the resistor? The current going through the resistor is V over R. The current going through the capacitor is C D V D T. And then there's also a current going through the inductor, and they have to sum to zero. Why do they have to sum to zero? KCL. All right. Now, what do I know about the inductor? What's the equation for the inductor say? I equals, no, it's. It's V equals L di dt. So how can I work that information? I want to, I want to get everything just in terms of voltage. Uh, I want to get differential equation, though. Right. I'm going to take the derivative of the whole thing. If I do that, I'm going to get V prime over R plus C V double prime 
plus the derivative of current. And what is the derivative <coughs> of the capacitor current, of the inductor current? Should be V over L. Yes? Where'd you get that uh, equation from? I took the derivative of this equation. Where, where'd you get that equation from? KCL, okay. Kirchhoff's current law. I found this current and this current and this current, and then by definition, they have to sum to zero. So this one was easy. I just called this one V over R. And this one was easy. I said that that's I equals C uh, dV dt. And this one, I just called it I sub L, because I didn't have a better term for it. I added them together and said they equaled zero. And then I said, ooh, if I take the derivative of the whole thing, then I can substitute I prime. The derivative of I is really just equal to V over L. C D V D T. Yeah. Yep. But how, what, is, uh, what, what would uh, current through L be? Uh, it's given by this equation. Mm -hmm. Right. But so that's just the trick for solving this. Is like I I didn't I could try to write this as I sub L equals uh, the integral of V over L D T, but it's just ugly. Like that doesn't get me anywhere. So instead I took my this equation, I took its derivative, and then once I had I once I had the derivative of i, I was able to make this substitution. And that's what leaves me with this. And in a final step, let me clean this up. V double prime plus uh, V prime 1 over RC. Am I good so far? Plus, plus what? 1 over LC equals 0. Oh, V over LC equals 0. So do I have a different differential equation? Absolutely. And that's cool, right? It is interesting to note that in both cases, the natural frequency is still set by the inductor and the capacitor. That just sets the, the, the sloshing frequency, I like to think about it, right? Energy sloshing back and forth. Every now and again, some of that energy makes it into the resistor, and the resistor dissipates it. So that's the dissipation. So you look at this, and you say, wow, well, they're, they're totally different, right? This sucks, OK? But the answer is they're really not that different, OK? At the end of the day, you can still write both equations in terms of v out double prime plus 2 zeta omega naught v out prime plus omega naught squared v out equals 0. So as long as you can solve for the natural frequency and the damping ratio, you're good to go. Yes, sir? What was the last part of that equation you raised? Down here? Yeah. I don't know. Mm, it's whatever this one was before I divided through by the capacitance. Yes? The character's equation I gave you actually had 1 over LC, not V over LC. Yeah, be, yeah, of course. Because then when you, this isn't the characteristic equation. This is the, this is the differential equation. When you go to solve the characteristic equation, it turns into S squared plus 1 over RCS plus 1 over LC equals 0. And then you solve for S. Okay? And then one of two things will happen. You either have a pair of complex conjugate poles in which case it's going to oscillate at that frequency and decay with that uh, decay ratio. Or you'll get two real poles. One of them will be dominant. One of them won't be dominant. And you'll just have a, you'll have a time constant, a 1 over RC kind of business. Right, right. That was my whole point, is that it doesn't always equal R over L. In this circuit, it did. But in this circuit, hey, come on in. In this circuit, it's something different. But as long as you can write the differential equation and get, and get something in this form, then it's easy. Then you say, I know my damping ratio. I know my natural frequency. After that, it's all the same. So that, that still, still the same, but the other one, uh, that differs. Like 1 over L C is the same for both circuits. Right, right, which was interesting. 1 over LC was the same in both circuits. That was kind of cool that that worked out. Yes? Will it always be necessary to use the zeta omega naught, or can you just use, like it says, the both um, S squared, and then you just plug in your resistors and capacitor values? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You can, 
I mean, if we were doing a real problem, you could just, you could just stick in the resistor and capacitor values, get an equation, and solve it for, um, you know, solve for your, your S's. Okay? All I'm saying is that, like, let's say you solve those S's and they're complex. You look at them, and you're going to get something like, you know, minus 1,000 plus or minus 4,000J. And what I'm saying is, is like that number in and of itself isn't very meaningful. However, if instead you can think of that number as like zeta and omega naught, then that's a more natural way of thinking about it because then you automatically don't have to do any more work. You just know what the answer is going to look like. It's going to oscillate at omega naught, and it's going to decay with some rate. So zeta omega naught is just a way of looking at what happens with the circuit. Yeah, exactly. It, it, gives, it gives you, right, it's a way of looking at the circuit. But all you need to do is just solve for s, and you're done. Yes? Wait, so how do you know which character you don't. You have to solve. Yeah, you actually have to use circuit skills. That's skills with a Z at the end, right? You know, you got to, you got to, there's no way. Like, you just, you got to, I don't know, you got to solve it. That's, that's it. There's no, I mean, the good news is I don't think there's a whole lot of ways you can, I mean, you can put them in series and you can put them in parallel. I don't really know that there's a ton of other options for making this work. But, yeah, basically you have to solve the differential equation, the end. What do you think? Sweet. OK. So we're going to play a little game here. It's not a very fun game, but we're going to play it nonetheless. Um, do you have questions? Yeah. How yeah. do you find that time, time constant on that? Well, if it was, um, if it was underdamped, the, the, it decays, the decay rate is minus zeta omega naught. Okay? If it's so basically you just have to solve the uh, we did an example of this. Look, if we so the question is how do you find the time constant? So so here's a case where it's it's uh, underdamped. All right, down here. So if it's underdamped, I solve for zeta, I solve for omega naught. Um, so when the time comp so for an underdamped system, it's uh, remember the decay rate is set by e to the minus zeta omega naught t times some cosine. So that was the decay term. And therefore, the time constant is, like if you, if you were to think of this term as e to the minus t over tau, then your time constant is just the reciprocal of that. And we did that. That's already in our spreadsheet. That's how we got that value. So, Pat, do you, do you, have, do you have both? Let me ask you a more general question. Should we work a hand example of this? Like, would that be helpful to people before we move on? OK. And we'll do it without PowerPoint. How about that, or without whatever? So let's do this. Should we stick with, um, let's just stick with our original circuit. Is that fine? Because it's all the same. OK. So for our original equation, we had s squared plus um, R over L S plus 1 over L C equals 0. OK? So let's let um, C equals half a microfarad, L equals um, 2 milli, what is it, Henry's? And let's let R equal um, 2 ohms. We on the same page? So let's just start by getting our characteristic equation. So it's S squared plus, what's R over L? It's 2 divided by 2 milli. One K. 1K, right? The 2's cancel. You're left with 1 over 1 times 10 to the minus 3. 
1 over 1 times 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the positive 3, which is 1,000. And if you can't remember that, just plug it in your calculator, right? Do 2 divided by 0 0.002, and you get 1,000. Plus 1 over LC. What's 1 over LC? Let's see. L times C is 1 times 10 to the minus ninth, because, okay, the half and the 2 cancel. That's minus 6. That's minus 3. So when you multiply them, you get minus 9. And then it's 1 over that. So this is 10 to the ninth equals 0. You with me? So far, so good? Solve the difference. So, so now we need to solve the characteristic equation. Okay. So I don't know. How do we do that? Do we know how to solve for this? Yeah. Quadratic equation, right? You know, sometimes some of you may have a button on your calculator that will actually just solve for the roots automatically. I use MATLAB. MATLAB's got a built in way of solving the roots, uh, provided that I can find the command line. So I'm looking at S equals minus 500 31.6, so plus or minus 31.6 kj. That's what I'm getting. Can somebody confirm or deny? I'm getting a thumbs up. I'm willing to bet every one of you that has one of these big old calculators, there's a button in there somewhere where you don't even have to type in the quadratic formula. You just type in the coefficients of your polynomial and it will tell you the roots. You should investigate this function and you should find it and you should write it down. Yes. Confirm. Okay, that's two confirms. Okay. Now, so I know for a fact because so I've got a I've got a um, complex roots. So I know for sure that my step response is going to look something like that. <coughs> Are we in agreement? Good. I need to know two things. OK, so the question is, I want to know, the sh like, I basically, the two things that I want to know are the frequency, yeah? And what else do I want to know? Right, how quickly it's going to decay. How can I get that from this? So this is what you were asking. Can you use the numbers? Totally. There's your numbers. Now what? That's where my method comes in. I help with the now what. Sorry, say again? Minus zeta omega naught is equal to minus 500. Minus zeta omega naught equals minus 500. That's right. And omega naught square root 1 minus zeta squared equals 31. Omega naught root 1 minus zeta squared equals 31.6k. So here's the thing. Basic, so we said, right, when we did this with like the generic version, when we just said that this was, I mean, I, what I encourage you to was to think of this as 2 zeta omega naught s plus omega naught squared equals 0. All right? So 
when you do that, if you think of it like that, then your, the roots of your equation come out to be uh, minus zeta omega naught plus or minus j omega naught root 1 minus zeta squared. And that's exactly what you're looking at here, okay? So, uh, that's, why, uh, so that, that's why we wrote this number down. So you're, this is, <coughs> this whole number here, that's basically the frequency at which it oscillates. The end. Yes? I keep getting hung up on where you get that stuff from, like the data making that and all Okay, so... You hung up on where these zetas and omega naughts came from? Yeah, this is kind of magic y, right? I just said, hey, let's just rewrite your constants in terms of those numbers. And you said, I don't know where that comes from. And I said, I don't, I would never, I didn't think of it either. Like, somebody figured out that the natural, um, you know, these properties of, of the uh, circuit could be captured if you, if you factor it like that. That's, I mean, that's it. It's just, yeah, I, I've, not really come up with a clever way of, of sort of indicating like where this came from. But it just turns out that it works. It, it yields all sorts of useful information. So look, the imaginary portion is always what tells you about the oscillations. So what's the frequency of oscillation here? 31.6K, right? What's the frequency of oscillation? 31.6K units. Nah, radians per second. So let's get that in hertz. How do I convert that to hertz? Divide by 2 pi. So if I take 31.6k, divide by 2 pi. So let's see. If I divide it by pi, that's going to give me about 10,000. Is that about 5,000 hertz? How's my driving? What's that? 5,029? All right. That's pretty close. So this is, why do you get the frequency for the oscillation? That's the, that's the frequency at which it's oscillating. 31,000 radians per second. Yes. <coughs> this? That's a J. That's also a J. OK. So the frequency is 5,000 hertz. So what's the period of oscillation? It's always, so this is omega, this is f, and this is t. t always equals the reciprocal of your frequency in hertz. So 1 over 5,000 is a shade under 2 milliseconds. Like 1.9? 1 .9. Exactly 0 0.2? Well, 1.98. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that if you started measuring here, how long till the next bump? 1.98 milliseconds. I got it. No, you did it wrong. <laughs> OK. Um, so there you go. So that's what that means, right? Yes? I got a little lost in the quadratic part. Like, the S squared for 1,000 has to send it out. Do you just do a quadratic equation on it? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I'm not getting the, negative, I'm not getting the, the uh, complex root part. I got the okay. 500. OK. So it's minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times that. So minus 4 times 10 to the ninth all over 2. We cool? So the minus 1,000 over 2, that gives you your minus 500. <clears throat> so let's see. 1,000 squared is a million. A million minus 4 billion. I need, I need a calculator for that. Okay, so 1,000 squared minus 4e9 
Boo! Okay. So it's 3 point, so it's the square root of minus 3.99, like how many nines? Three nines times 10 to the ninth. Is that right? So I've got a square root of a minus. So that's cool. I just bought myself a j. Right? So now I've got to take the square root of 3.9999 whatever, 10 to the ninth. So if I take the square root of that, I get, so if I take the square root of 3.99 times 10 to the ninth, I get 6.3 something times 10 to the fourth. And I divide it by 2. I get that. Is that not? Is that not what's happening on your calculator? Oh, okay. I totally didn't understand the K is a thousand. K is a thousand. All right, we're back. Um, yes, K is a thousand. Yes. It's the cove. It's the imaginary bit. That's whatever is dangling over here. That tells you the oscillation frequency. Fun. Okay. So it turns out, I mean, before I was telling you that it oscillates basically at omega naught. And that's mostly true. Like, w the root 1 minus zeta squared isn't going to change your answer very much. Uh, like, if we solve for omega naught and compare omega naught to omega naught root 1 minus zeta squared, they're basically the same number. That's why I said, hey, you don't even need to do all this. Just find omega naught, and that's your oscillation frequency. You know, you'll be accurate to within like 1%. So who cares? OK, now the other thing I need to estimate is the time constant, how quickly it decays. Yes? OK. So where is that coming from? It's the real part. OK. The imaginary part tells you the, tells you the oscillation. The real part tells you the decay. So basically what, what this is telling me, How much do you think I'm going to be able to sue the university for when my lungs fill up with chalk dust and I die a painful death? I'm going to cash in. It's going to be awesome. OK, yes. <laughs> um, OK, oh, oh, right. So basically, what this is telling me is remember, our whole thing was we were trying to find a solution e to the st? Well, there you go. Here's your e to the st. So e to the minus 500 t. OK, but it's usually more helpful to think of things in terms of time constants, no? So instead of saying e to the minus 500t, I'm going to say e to the minus t over tau. What's my tau? One over minus, well, it's actually just one over 500, because the, I kept the minus sign out of it, right? So. I can totally rewrite it like this. It'll be e to the minus t over tau, where tau is 1 over 500. Right, it's 0.002. It's two, 2 milliseconds, right? How are you getting the minus t over tau? Well, I'm just saying, instead of writing it like this, I just, I just want to write it like this. And I can totally do that as long as I pick, I mean, for, for, forget this step. Are these the same number? Is this the same equation? Totally, because 1 over 2 milliseconds is 500. So instead of writing it like this, I choose to write it like this. And if I do that, I can interpret this term to be the time constant. So what does the time constant tell me? Hold on. The time constant tells me the rate of decay. In every two milliseconds, it's going to decay by 63 percent. Yes. Is another e to the st, right? Yeah. What happened to the rest of this? The st goes to 500 plus sine. Well, we we took care of this. This gave us the this is this is what gave us the the cosine, right? So, in essence, when when you have, it is e to the st, right? It's e to the st, but in our case, our s was minus 500 plus uh, j times 31k. And there was another one where it was minus 500 
minus uh, J31K. So that's, that's e, to the, e to the S T. So all I'm saying is that's really the same as e to the five, minus 500 T times e to the J 31 K T. So basically what you've got is, and then you've got another one where it's, um, you've got the other one where it's e to the minus 500 minus J 31 point whatever K. Right, is e to the minus 500 plus and e to the minus 500 minus. So this one becomes e to the minus 500 t e to the minus j 31 k. So look what happens. What can you factor out of both terms? e to the minus 500 t. <coughs> What's left? e to the j, e to the minus j. That's a cosine. We talked about that, right? That e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta is a cosine. We said that e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta equals uh, 2 cosine theta. And there you go. This and this is a cosine, right, at that frequency. I'm sorry? Is that one? Is what one? Two cosine theta. No, it's just two cosine theta. OK. But my point is, you're asking what happened to the, all the imaginary part. It's a product. OK? When you get a complex root like this, what you really wind up with is a product. You get one term is a cosine, whose frequency is the complex root, the, the imaginary portion. And then the other part you get is a decaying exponential, which is set by the real part of the root. And that's it. So that's what I've done over here. You've got a cosine whose frequency you could predict, and you've got a decaying exponential whose, whose, whose time constant you could predict. Are we making things better or worse? Go, oh, good. OK. I'll, wear, I'll, I'll own that. So that's where your time constant came from. I think it was just a coincidence in this case. Yeah, it's just a coincidence. Maybe next time I do this, I'll pick a different value to differentiate between them. OK. Now, all of this made sense because we had, so this is all for the case of complex roots. So what if we do the same problem? But I change my resistor from 2 to um, 500. <clears throat> so I'm going to change my resistor from 2 to 500. Right? Wash, rinse, repeat. So what's my characteristic equation now? It's S squared plus R over L is no longer the same thing. That's 500 which is a half of a thousand, half, that's a quarter of a million, 250K? Booyah! Plus, one of our LC is still the same, right? That's a billion. So far, so good? Same thing, right? I've just changed my resistor. So this term stayed the same because it wasn't dependent on R. But now this term has changed because it was dependent on R. Before it was um, 1,000. Now it's 250,000. What's the next step? Solve for S. OK. Let's go to our special place where we do this sort of thing. Ugh.
OK, so for the first root I'm getting, minus 2.46 times 10 to the fifth. I'm getting for one of them. And for the other root, I'm getting <laughs> negative 4.0 times 10 to the 3. So let's talk time constants. Right? So first of all, do either is there going to be any oscillations in my step response? No, right? Here's how I can tell. In order to get oscillations in my step response, I need an imaginary term. In this case, my imaginary term <coughs> zero. There's no oscillations. Pretty cool, right? It all fits together. So I have no oscillations because I have no imaginary terms. Without imaginary terms, you don't have cosines. So what I've got is e to the st, where s is those two values. <laughs> now, again, for the same reasons as before, it's easier to think of things in terms of time constants, right? So whenever I can say e to the st, I can also say e to the minus t over tau. Can I not? It's the same thing. I just have to change s into tau. So let's start with this one. If s1 is equal to this number, what's tau going to equal? <coughs> Let's see. Four microseconds. Wicked fast. Right? So all I did is I dumped the minus sign, and I took the reciprocal. Right? That was equal to minus 1 over S1, which is exactly what I would need to do to convert s into a time constant. All right, how about for the other one? I'm getting O point. Two five. I'm basically getting like a quarter, 0 0.245 milliseconds. So I'm getting two time constants. <clears throat> now what? Oh crap! I gotta keep an eye on the time. Do I need both those time constants? You sort of do, but you remember there was this other piece of the puzzle that we calculated the k, the coefficient, because really what our answer is, is y equals 1 plus some constant e to the minus uh, t over tau 1 plus k2 e to the minus t over some other time constant. And we actually had a formula for calculating k1 and k2. Did we not? If you were to find that time constant, OK? So if you were to find that, that value of k, the formula for the k, what you would find in this case is that one of them would be very big and one of them would be very small. Does anybody remember which one's going to be which? Keeping in mind that I've forgotten. Oh, no, I remember. Right, so I think the formulas were something like uh, K2 equals minus S2 over S1 minus S2, and K1 equals. Um, I think it's minus S1. Minus S1 over S1. 
Oh, yeah, 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 minus S1. That's right. And this was just S2 over S1 minus S2. I think that's right. So if you do that in this case, what you're going to find is that this term is really small. I'll leave it to you to go and plug the numbers in at home. But this number is going to be something like 0 0.001. And this number is going to be like a much bigger coefficient. This is going to be like, ooh, like pretty big by comparison, like 1.001. .001. So what that means is that if this coefficient is really, really small, you can basically ignore this term. And what's left? This term with this time constant. So which is the dominant time constant? It's going to be this one, because it's got the big multiplier out front. So if I go to look at my step response, it's going to look roughly like that. It's going to have a final value of 1. All right, And the time constant associated with it will be roughly equal to t2, right? which is about a quarter millisecond. It's not that this other time constant isn't there. It's just that it's multiplied by such a teensy-weensy little multiplier that it basically doesn't matter. OK? So that's what sets the, the, the rise time of your response. Yeah. It's always going to be whichever one of these has the um, smaller time constant. Sorry, the, where am I? The bigger time constant, no, one more try. I can do it, I can do it. The bigger time constant is always going to have the bigger multiplier. That it will always work out. It's just kind of cool. Right, so it's always, big. whichever one of these is bigger, that's always going to be the dominant one. Because the, the other one will always have such a small multiplier. It just works out that way. So that's pretty cool, right? So that's two examples end to end. So I guess sort of the moral of the story is you don't have to sweat too much. I mean, the whole thing with zeta and omega naught is that they give you some sort of um, characteristics of the, of the circuit that kind of help you understand them like quickly and intuitively. Like once you get to this, if you take its square root, that's basically the oscillating frequency of the system without having to do too much work. Okay, and you can also figure out the damping ratio and figure out whether or not it's going to um, remember, if the damping ratio is bigger than 1, it's overdamped. And if it's less than 1, it's underdamped. Those are just sort of critical values that, that, that are characteristics of the circuit. But really, if you're just trying to get an answer, you don't need to sweat those details too much. Oh, we are out of time. I have a quiz for you, but I worry I've gone too long. Fine, Monday. I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm not happy about it. Wait, what is it on? I'm not telling you what it's on. Um, what are, I got still got five minutes of your time now. No. Yes. Yes. Well, I don't know. What have we been doing in class? Um, okay. I, I, here, let me do this real quick. I want you to think about this over the weekend because this is sort of. I, I feel like let me at least set up. I'm glad we did this. I'm, I'm glad that we've kind of taken the time to go through this. Um, having said that, it's clear that sinusoids are not a strong suit. And this class is basically about understanding circuit responses to sinusoids. So. There's a cosine. How can I calculate its frequency? Right? If you're looking at this, if you came to my lab and I showed you this on an oscilloscope and I said, tell me the frequency of that. One over the period. One over the period. How do I get the period? One over the frequency? That's good. <laughs> How long it takes to complete one cycle? Does it matter where I start measuring from? No. Right? If I start measuring here, I count how long it takes to get to there. If I start counting here, I see how long it takes to get to there. It doesn't matter. Just how long it takes to get through one complete cycle. So we call that T, which is our P 
period, and that's always in units of time, right? Typically seconds. Okay, from there, how do I get my frequency in hertz? 1 over t, okay? That's my frequency in hertz. Hertz means cycles per second. So for example, if my period is a tenth of a second, how many cycles does it do in one period? 10 cycles, 10 hertz. Yeah? It's not bad, right? Now, we have another unit of frequency <coughs> called radians per second. How do we get radians per second? Good. You at least know the formula. That's a good start. 2 pi times the frequency in hertz, and the units is radians per second. Where does that come from? Why do we even mess with this ridiculous unit that doesn't, you know, has no physical significance? So it turns out, that was a rhetorical question. OK. So it turns out that one complete cycle, like if you go around a circle, how many radians are in a circle? Two, two pi. So one cycle is always two pi. So if I do 10 hertz, if I do 10 cycles in one second, then how many radians have I done? Right, for, for each of those cycles, I did 2 pi radians. So 2 pi times 10, that's the total number of radians I did in one, in one second. Oh, so you think you understand cosines now. That's good. All right, so I come to you and I say, x of t equals 4 cosine uh, 6t minus 2. Plot it without your calculator. Mm. Yeah, we have a uh, omega, we have the phases and the four amplitude. Okay, so let's start with this. <coughs> What's the units of six? Radians per second? It's radians per second. Okay. <laughs> so basically, you have two ways of doing this. You can either say cosine omega t, where omega is in radians per second, or equivalently, cosine 2 pi f t, where f is in hertz. All right, same business. OK, so, my, so 6 is my frequency in radians per second. What's my frequency in hertz? I mean, what, do I, what am I going to do to this number to get my frequency in hertz? Divide by 2 pi. So whatever 6 over 2 pi is, that's got to be a close to 1 hertz, right? right? Because pi is basically 3 to an engineer. So 6 over 2 times 3 is it's in the neighborhood of 1. OK, what, you want like 0.94? I mean, is that, is that closer? 0.955, all right. 0.955 hertz. And it's got a period in um, that's 1 over f. So that'll be a shade more than 1, like 1.05 seconds. Fun. What does the 2 do for me? It's going to be a shift, right? Am I going to shift my cosine left or right? Shift it to the right. What is the units of 2? OK, so that's where we're going to start on Monday. When I come into class on Monday, I'm going to say, what's the units of 2? And you guys are all going to cheer me on with the right answer in unison. OK, you've got all weekend to think about it. All right, see you on Monday.